Today is Veterans Day, and I want to take a moment <coughs> and talk to you about the Medal of Honor. Um, in Romans 12, 10, the Bible says, Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. You know, honor is produced by humility. Dishonor is produced by pride. So when you dishonor someone, it's usually because of your pride that's inside you. And pride is a terrible sin. Proverbs 15, 33, fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor. I believe honor is produced by pursuing righteousness, true honor. And I believe dishonor is produced by pursuing unrighteousness, ungodly things. Proverbs 21, 21 says, whoever pursues righteousness and unfailing love will find life, righteousness, and honor. Honor is something that we've lost in our society. We don't honor authority. We don't honor age. We don't honor people who are uh, learned. We, we have found a society and a generation of dishonor. As we see in the streets of America right now, dishonoring the election and the results of that election. But honor is a word that's used in Scripture often. Honor or honorable, that word can be found 191 times in the Bible. 1 Timothy 5.17 says, The elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. Now, I, I said Paul was a preacher and a teacher, so maybe he was asking for double honor. I don't know. Now, I think he was just teaching Timothy exactly how he should approach shepherding the flock and, and the elders should approach loving the people and that they would receive double honor from, from double service. I think these passages show the, the spiritual place God gives to honor. He's saying those who lead you deserve honor. 1 Peter 3, 7. Then he adds, husbands, dwell with your wife according to your knowledge, giving honor. Giving honor, gentlemen, to your wives. Then Revelation 4, 9, we read of the honor that's to be given to the Lord in heaven. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you are worthy, O Lord, or our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. He, the Lord, is worthy. We sing it often here, but do we live our lives bearing out what we sing and what we preach? Do we honor the Lord in every way? Psalm 91, 15. This is interesting to me. He will call upon me. Prayer folks will call upon me and I will answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. God is talking about honoring you. When will he honor you? When you call upon Him, He'll be with you. Can you imagine the Lord honoring us, saying He honors us? Wow. But the righteousness that's in your heart brings honor from God to the believer. Paul in Romans thirteen seven says, Give everyone what you owe him in respect, then, then respect. If respect, then respect. If honor, then give honor. We should honor certain people. You know, we honor judges. We call them your honor. We stand when they enter the courtroom. When a bride comes in, we honor the bride by, by standing. When a funeral is going on, when they wheel the casket in or out, we stand in honor to that person who has gone to be with the Lord. Each of these acts is an act of respect. It is honor. Many of our servicemen have given their lives and they received the Medal of Honor. In 1921, there was another way to honor these unknown soldiers. 1921, World War One American soldier was laid to rest at Arlington National Cemetery. And that Carol and I have been there, that beautiful site overlooking the Potomac. What a beautiful place to be. It became the focal point of reverence for America's soldiers and veterans. Armistice Day received its declaration after the end of World War One in a congressional uh, resolution. It became a national holiday in 1938. Years later, realizing that peace was equally preserved by the veterans of World War II and Korea, uh, the day was requested that it become an occasion 
to serve all those who've served in American wars. And in 1954, President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed a bill proclaiming November 11th, this last Friday, as Veterans Day. Then on Memorial Day of 1958, two more unidentified American soldiers were brought from overseas uh, beside the unknown soldier of World War I. One was killed in World War II, one in the Korean War. Then in 1984, an unknown serviceman from Vietnam was placed alongside the others. To honor these men, symbolic of all Americans who have served and given their lives, an Army Honor Guard, we call them Honor Guards because they stand 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. They keep vigil day and night over those who are unknown. As we remember those who've died protecting our freedoms, I think today this veteran's theme is important. But at the same time, I want to explore what it means to be a member of the army of God. We sang it earlier. There's an army rising up. How many believe that? You believe there's an army rising from the church, from the church of the living God? Look, I know America has its own set of problems. I know some of you are, as I said in that little blurb in the bulletin, some of you may be sad at the election results. Some of you may be glad. doesn't matter. I still believe America is the greatest nation that God ever let be on the face of the earth. And I am proud to be an American. You know, our freedoms are amazing. You can move anywhere in this nation you want to move. You don't have to ask anybody. Can I move to California? That'd be a mistake probably. Uh, or New York. Another mistake probably. Can I move to Florida? It's up to you. It's not up to anybody else. You can choose where you live. Isn't that, a, isn't that a great freedom? You don't have to get papers signed by some governmental official. You can just go. The freedom to elect our governing officials. And, and the freedom we have because of that to worship in this place freely the way we want to worship. These freedoms weren't given without sacrifice. Men and women have died to give us the privilege of worshiping in this room today. We are free because men and women have fought, risked, and sacrificed their lives to keep us free. America's greatness right now can be seen in, in our present day. Think about it. One of the few nations in the world where peaceful transition, sort of peaceful, get those crazy people off the streets, but... Peaceful transition from one administration to another. Amazing, isn't it? Look, all you need to do is look at the events going on across the world and see how blessed we are. To see how good we have it. The conflicts, though, that we've had have, have always had their share of casualties. That's just the way life is. People are unkind to one another. People are grabbing for power, fame, and money, and authority. And during those conflicts... When men have given extra special service and gone out of their way, risked their lives, some have died doing it, they're given what our government calls the Medal of Honor. This award is given to someone who distinguishes himself, goes beyond the call of duty at the risk of his own life. Personal bravery, self-sacrifice, distinguishing that person from many of the people who were standing around beside him. There are a couple of individuals I want to bring to your attention today. One is George D. Libby, the other Douglas Albert Monroe. On July 20th, 1950, while breaking through an enemy encirclement in Korea, Sergeant Libby was riding in a vehicle approaching a, an enemy roadblock and they threw a grenade, it exploded, fire went everywhere, killing all the passengers except Sergeant Libby. He took cover in a ditch, he engaged in in fire, gunfire, back and forth. He crossed the road twice to find a couple of wounded and bring them back to his side of the road. He helped a passing art, he hailed a passing artillery tractor, rather, while he helped others get onto that tractor. They're moving through enemy fire. Enemy directed fire was going on constantly, and they were firing at the driver, thinking if they could knock him out, then they'd take care of that whole group. But Sergeant Libby jumped up and got in between the driver and the fire and started taking some of those shots himself in his body and in his arms and his chest. They went all the way through the town. The tractor made stops along the way, picking up other wounded military men and putting them on that tractor. They finally got to the place where they were able to administer health 
and healing to those men who were injured. Sergeant Libby had all those sustained wounds, but he received the Medal of Honor. He lived, and others said thank you. Also, a Medal of Honor awarded to Petty Officer Monroe on September 27, 1942. He was engaged in a group of boats who were trying to evacuate and rescue soldiers caught in the crossfire on Guadalcanal. He had made plans for uh, 24 boats to go and 500 people to be rescued, evacuated. During machine gun fire coming at them, he led five boats to the beach and they landed and they gathered people up. But when the perilous task was almost finished, he himself was killed. But his crew carried on till the last boat had taken those men to safety. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Many, many more stories. You may have some. You veterans may know some men who died right in, in, in your presence. I don't know. But these men and men like them put their lives in danger, extreme danger. And some gave their lives that others might live. Seems in every war and every battle, heroic action, actions occur that, that seem beyond uh, what we would be able to normally think of. First Samuel 2.30 says, I'll honor those who honor me. And I'll despise those who think lightly of me. Honor means to put value or, or a weighty value, precious respect on someone. Romans 12.10 again, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor that person above yourself. Sometimes that's hard to do, isn't it? We put somebody before ourselves risking our own life. That's exactly what happened in a small Middle Eastern country a couple thousand years ago. And you know where I'm headed with this. This hero has strong similarities to what I've just outlined with these military men. But there are some significant differences. He was raised in Nazareth. He was the earthly son of a man named Joseph, a carpenter. We don't know very much about Jesus' early life. We don't know a lot about where he was. We know his birth and we know he was a, a boy in a carpenter shop. We know when he was 12, he was in the temple saying to his parents, don't you know I've got to be about my father's business? And then there's a space in there and a jump ahead in time to his adult life and his ministry. When among both the Jews and the Gentiles, we revere him today. Many of the Jews who found Christ real to their life, I praise God for those Christian Jews who have found Christ but really, if you look at his life and where he came from, who would have expected such heroic action from a, from a, a little guy like that? Growing up in a carpenter shop. People in his own town turned against him and said, who does he think he is? And he couldn't do mighty miracles there because they didn't respect him. They didn't honor him. They didn't give him place. Prophet Isaiah said, physically, there was nothing about him that would have hinted at the heroics that he did. The, the divine things that happen. He's probably not like we would usually picture our heroes. Like your kids would picture heroes. Even from the army of today. Paul wrote in Philippians 2. Who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal to God. But made himself of no reputation. Taking the form of a bond servant. And coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. Even to the death of the cross. Jesus put himself in harm's way. He chose to do that. They couldn't have killed him had he chosen not to. He chose. Isaiah 53, 4 says. He's borne our griefs, carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He took it upon himself. He was bruised for our iniquities. He took our sin. The chastisement for our peace. He, he gave us peace because he was without it. And by his stripes were healed. He saved us. Took our sins. Healed us. And he did it willingly. He understood what he was facing when he came. Verse 7 says, he was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Matthew, Matthew says he re responded to the pain and the suffering with the words, not by will, but thine be done. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Again, being found in appearance like a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the death of a cross. Paul said this in Romans 5, verse 7. He said, scarcely 
a righteous man, for a righteous man one will die. It's not often that even for the righteous, someone would give their life. Maybe for a good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrated his love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We were the lowest of the low, darkest of the dark, the most sinful people. And yet Jesus gave his life. The comparison falls short, doesn't it? The men and women of the military put their lives in danger for the sake of their fellow, fellow soldiers. But, and, and when we look at that, we go, we praise their heroic actions. But the battle against Christ was larger and deeper and wider than what these men have done. The ultimate victory was not simply the taking of a mountain or a beachhead. It was taking away the sin of the world. Defeating the enemy of God. The battle was for our souls to give us life eternal. The victory over power and the devil and the sin that was in our lives. And victory over death. Even Peter, who was one of Jesus' central military terms, will call Peter a lieutenant. He said in 1 Peter 3.15, Instead, you must worship Christ as the Lord of your life. And if someone asks you about your hope as a believer, be ready to explain it. Be ready to say, you know, there were many men who died in the battlefield to give us freedom. But I know one who died on a cross who gave us true and ultimate freedom. He says in 1 Peter 5, he said, be vigilant, be sober. Look out, our adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by brothers and sisters around the world. You only have to look to the Middle East. Just this week we heard of uh, hundreds of people who had been beheaded and, and cast into a mass grave. And some cities they were hanging them up by their heels and beheading them and leaving the bodies hanging. These people are vicious, they're vile, they're devilish, they're demonic. But the Romans were the same. Think about it. Crosses would line the roadways with people's corpses on the crosses to bring the people in the territories they were ruling unto submission. This is historical fact. Look, we have to be vigilant today. I said it Thursday night, and I'll say it to you again. We have a window of opportunity because if you believed in what happened that we had a victory for the Word of God. Not about a man. Not about a woman. It's about the direction of this nation and this world. And it's about the Bible, the Word of God. And when we stand for the Bible, we have to stand against something. Because if you don't stand against something, you become nothing. And what we have done is simply stood up and said, we believe the Bible. We believe what we voted for. Now, it's not time to quit. It's time to continue on and to be vigilant and to move forward and to stay on our knees and to stay vigilant in prayer before God that God will come and show Himself to our nation and to our world and change things that are against the Word of God. My vote's always with the Bible. My vote, yeah, I have to cast in. I have to write somebody's name in, but always with the Word of God. I want those who will lead us correctly. You know... The clearest, most dynamic of example of how Christ's life and his death and resurrection inspired us and changed us is the fact that we're here this morning. You think about it. The fact that we're gathered here to worship, to hear the word of God, to be challenged by the word, to sing, to offer up our prayers and to encourage one another, to meet new people who are going to heaven with us. We need to be honest with ourselves. In a world of terrorist attacks and where individuals don't hesitate to give their lives in one particular religious group to destroy innocents who don't believe like they do. We're ones who give our lives to save others, not to destroy others. This is the difference in who Christ is and who we are as followers of Jesus. As Christians, we can be sure that on the spiritual front, it's a different story. Here's the battle we fight. Second Corinthians 10, 3. For though we walk in the world, we do not fight according to the world's rules of warfare. The weapons of the war we're fighting are not of this world, but they're powered through God and effective at tearing down strongholds erected against His truth. And in Ephesians 6, Paul talks about our armor, our uniform, 
the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet fitted with the gospel of peace. We carry the shield of faith. We have the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. That's our armor. That's our weaponry. That's who we are. We fight against the devil, not against humanity. The story is told of a soldier who lived with the confidence that certain things were going to happen because of prayer. During the Korean War, a man got hurt badly and he was 50 yards from the foxhole where his comrades were. And the sniper fire continued at such a pace that not one of them felt safe to move from where they were over to get the man 50 yards away and drag him back to the foxhole. And so one of the men in the foxhole began looking at his watch. The other guy, guys could hear their comrade wounded 50 yards away screaming for help. Please help me, please help me. The guy kept looking at his watch. The other men around him couldn't figure out what he was doing. They began to ask questions to themselves. What's he doing? But he looked at his watch one last time and he jumped up and he ran to the man. He grabbed him. By the collar, he dragged him 50 yards back into that foxhole. The other men were amazed. And after the sniper fire had died down, his buddies asked him, why did you wait so long? If you were going to do that, why didn't you go? He said, wait, wait, no. He said, my mom said every day at a certain time, she would go into her prayer closet and she would be praying for me. And I knew, according to my watch, that moment was the moment she was on her knees praying. And I believed that the angels of God were around me and I would be protected. There's a man who believed in the power of prayer. We have God's promise that we are guaranteed victory. We've read the back of the book. Victory is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ. But the battles will continue. We know what's going to happen. So how do we win this victory? Well, it's pretty clear. I read it a moment ago. I'm going to read it again. Romans 5. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will a man die for even a righteous man or even a good man. But God showed us his love by sending his best gift, Jesus, to a cross, a place called Calvary. The Bible says in Romans, there's none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.10, none righteous. Jesus didn't die for good people. He died for the sinner. He died for you and me, the ungodly. He didn't die for the righteous. He died for the man who can't do it for himself. How many of us agree that I can't do it for myself? I need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. I needed him to stand where I would be standing if he hadn't done it. Let me help you visualize this better. Let's, let's take this for instance. Let's say a guy... Stone cold drunk or on drugs or high comes walking through the doors and he's just loud and his voice is loud and he's cursing and he's saying bad words. His, his eyes are glassy, his speech is slurred and he stumbles in, looked like he just came in after a night on Skid Row somewhere. Uh, now look around, look at your neighbor. Does that feel, does he looked like he would be uh, embraced in here. He'd be welcomed here. Look around. You see anybody like that here? Well, in this non-judgment place, it'd be okay. If somebody came in here, how many agree with that? Somebody came in here like that, that would be okay. We'd love him. We'd pray for him. Would we? But the question is, would we readily and easily accept him? Would some of us step back? I mean, but what if, what if that man who came in called your name and said, Hey, sis, or hey, brother, what if he was your sister or your brother or you were his sister? Or your brother. What, what, what about that? And he says, I was told I could find you here. And he's smelly and he's stinky. And he walks toward you. And while he's walking toward you, he throws up all over someone who's sitting there. And it's just a nasty mess. He gets within a row or two of you. And suddenly, he says, I'm sorry for what I've done. He starts to cry. He lays down on the floor. He rolls around. And, and now... Only you, he didn't call your name yet. He just said sister. But only you know who he is. Only you know he's your brother. Would you run out the door before anyone could find out? 
Or would you come to him and embrace him and say, I love you. I've missed you. On that heap in the church floor, through tears, bad smell, body odor, no matter how many weeks it's been that he hadn't taken a bath, would you run to his side and embrace him? Would you, would you love on him? Or would you be repulsed and embarrassed? That's the question, isn't it? As wild as this story sounds, we're in Luke 15. Do you remember the story of a guy named the prodigal son? Think about it. He was filthy and he was nasty. He had a new perfume called Eau de Pig. <laughs> Stinky, dirty, nasty. Uh, the Bible pictures him not being much of a prize, you know. But you know what else it says? It says he was happy to settle for just a servant's place. But it says the father. Amen. Think about it. The father was waiting for him in the road. And ran to him. Now look at your own life for a moment. God ran to you. He loved you enough to run to you. And he sent his son to run to you. And he said to you, I love you just the way you are. You may be stinky and dirty and not smell good. And you may not know how to talk in church. And, you know, I've said for a long time, not our job to clean people up. It's God's job. We catch them. God cleans them. That's why this is a no judgment zone. Come in here looking, smelling, talking. Listen, I've had people who are new Christians who use the same curse words they use. In my presence, they use them just like they would, and I never say a word. You know why? Because they got some growing to do. I love them. I try to get them in the Word. Try to get them in some classes. Try to do what we can, but it's up to God to clean them up. And He will. If we don't condemn, I'm not going to go through all that again, but you know my feeling on condemn, convict, judge, and accuse. That's not our job. Our job is to love people. Like the Father Love the prodigal. Hebrews 2.11 says, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. No matter how they look. Where they've been. Look, you, you may be here today. You may be poor as a church mouse. You might could not give one penny in the offering. I don't care. That's between you and God. Not, I just try to teach you the principles. Maybe, maybe you've been abused and molested. And in your life, you, you've been put down. And you've been told you will never amount to anything. Maybe you feel... So unable to look people in the eye. God loves you. He gave His very best for you. You may feel His life's passing you by and, and nobody pays attention to you. Look, maybe you're in a position in life where you feel like you just want to quit, give up, get out of here. God loves you. God has a good plan for you. Jesus gave His life for you. He stood between you and the, the bullets of the devil. The destruction of the devil that the devil wanted to bring on your life. You're still here. You're here this morning in this place. It's not over for you. And oh yes, he's more than happy to lay claim to you as one of his own. He doesn't judge you for what you've been. And where you've been. And what you've done. He just wants you to be. I, I, I talked Thursday night about being and doing, about commitment. It's more important to God that you be than that you do. He wants you to be what He's called you to be. Then your doing has purpose. But when you're trying to do without the be, it's empty. 